Hey everyone, so recently I interviewed Microsoft personnel from both the backwards compatibility team and the advanced technology group. So essentially, one team is working on the games that are already out, and the other is working with developers on the titles of the future. Now there is some overlap here, so for example the HDR support built into Xbox One X Enhanced 360 titles, well that derives from a reverse tone mapping algorithm built by the ATG team. But there's much more to it than that. Yes, Microsoft is keen on compatibility across the generations of Xboxes, but there's also the question of scalability too. Out of the box improvements on new hardware, not just Xbox One X, but the Xboxes of the future. It's all part of transforming Xbox from a traditional console with set generations into more of a platform where you can take your games with you from one machine to the next and so on. They're also looking to work with developers to introduce some level of future-proofing into the games that we're playing today. Now, the idea here is to maximize graphical fidelity on today's GPU hardware while laying the groundwork to make those games look better and potentially even play better on the hardware of tomorrow. It's an ambitious concept, but with the launch of Xbox One X, we already have some evidence that it's working. And in the multi-platform world we live in today, there's every possibility that Sony could tap into those ideas too for the next generation PlayStation. Right, so there are two particular techniques coming into play that have defined the visual makeup of a number of the latest games running on the most advanced engines. And these should scale up nicely when true next gen console successors arrive. Those techniques, dynamic resolution scaling and temporal super sampling. So in essence, you can think of TAA as a technology primarily for the here and now, for the machines of today. It's actually being used to almost literally blur the lines between the same games running on Xbox One, PS4, Pro and the X. Four machines with very different power profiles. I mean, obviously there's commonality there on the CPU side of things, which helps a great deal, but GPU wise, 1.3 teraflops, 1.84, 4.2, 6 teraflops. That's a massive range to accommodate. And as we've seen this quarter, TAA works nicely as a kind of leveler of sorts. Now, truth is, there's not much difference from one rendered frame to the next, and where changes are made, the developer typically knows how the pixels will shift. So previous frames can be expertly blended with the current one to give a smoother, more filmic look. The Frostbite engine does this. It Tech 6 does it. Call of Duty, now there are many more games, come to think of it, not all of them third party, so off the top of my head. Fallout 4, Skyrim, Uncharted 4, Horizon Zero Dawn. TAA has proven to produce exceptional results and I can only see this temporal processing gaining more momentum in the games of tomorrow. But in the multi-platform space, moving up the console power ladder, it's fair to say that TAA's quality does scale with resolution. The more pixels you have, the better the overall clarity of the image. It's a technique that varies in effectiveness between games, but here in Assassin's Creed Origins, it closes a fair amount of the gap in perceptual image quality between Pro and X, despite the pixel counts between the two systems often being leagues apart. There's a smoother, more filmic look that does become distinctly blurrier on the base consoles, Xbox One in particular. But on this title at least, there are diminishing returns between the two 4K orientated consoles. Wolfenstein 2 though, yeah, this kind of shows the limits of TAA when applied to dynamic 1440p imagery on PS4 Pro and anything up to a dynamic 2160p on Xbox One X. When you're pumping out anything up to 2.25 times the amount of pixels on the Microsoft machine, yes, you can see a dramatic increase in clarity in many scenarios. Truth is, we've seen a few titles now from respected developers showing a big increase in raw pixel count between the two consoles. But games like these and add in Star Wars Battlefront 2, Call of Duty World War 2, well, the X does well, but there's still future scalability built in when these games eventually run on the true next generation Xbox. And that's all down to dynamic resolution scaling, or DRS. So the aim here is to keep your GPU fully tapped out without impacting too much, if at all, on frame rate. Let's take Assassin's Creed Origins again as an example. On Xbox One X, there's a kind of 1700p to 1800p resolution for the majority of gameplay. Now, this looks pretty good, but the technology itself has the capability to reach full 4K 2160p. Now, you won't see that in the here and now. Even the X doesn't have the horsepower to get the job done. But what about the future? Well, 
It's the same for other games we've talked about. Battlefront 2, World War 2, Wolfenstein 2. They can't hit full fat 4K in the here and now on the current generation hardware, but in the future on the next gen Xbox. Well, Microsoft's ATG team has been championing DRS for some time now for two reasons. First of all, you get scalability between S and X consoles in the here and now, especially when combined with TAA. And secondly, there's potential for future out-of-the-box improvements on next-gen hardware. So yeah, I mean, there's no reason why a next-gen Xbox couldn't deliver 2160p on all of those titles. And we've already seen that potential improvement to a certain extent. So back when I started reviewing Xbox One X before the 4K patches came along, we saw a big bunch of out-of-the-box improvements on games that supported dynamic resolution. Well, as I filmed this, we're still waiting for The Witcher 3's 4K patch, but right now you can play the game at 1080p on Xbox One X, and that's something you could never do on the base Xbox One, which sort of topped out at around 900p. The game adjusts resolution based on load, and the X delivers more than enough GPU power to ensure that the game is running tapped out all of the time. Now, Infinite Warfare did get a dynamic 4K patch, but before it did, the frame rate drops and resolution scaling of the base Xbox One version, well, they just completely vanished. Doom 2016, again, a night and day improvement. No 4K patch there right now, but as things stand, dynamic scaling has massively improved image quality there, and there's a big performance uptick. Funny thing about Doom though, it's possible to bring up patch data from the dashboard, and there is mention of Scorpio here. And yet, to the best of our knowledge, there's been no 4K patch. Now, our best guess? Well, developers can recompile existing games under the latest XDK and simply run them with the full power of the new GPU. You get approximately half of that in back compat mode, an equivalent of three teraflops if you like. So, recompiling with the latest development environment is an easy route to getting more out of the existing code with little effort required by the developer. And there's another title Microsoft pointed out to me as showing big benefits, again with no additional input from the developer. Mirror's Edge Catalyst hails from an era where DICE's Frostbite engine ran on Xbox One at just 720p for 60 frames per second titles. Except, well in this case that's not the full story, although resolution was always pretty low there, it was actually dynamic on this title, so there is a significant boost on Xbox One X. You can get an idea of the improvements here. Now we did do some measurements and found that resolution doesn't lock to 1080p by any stretch, but there's certainly an uptick in fluidity and image quality. You're getting big boosts here from both the CPU and GPU upgrades in Xbox One X. And it's this principle that we can expect to see roll out onto future generations of hardware. So yeah, what about the future? How can we expect scalability to improve in the next gen consoles? Well, look, we can assume that all of these Xbox One X enhanced titles will also get out-of-the-box improvements just running on the next-gen Microsoft hardware. I mean, the X delivered improvements like forced 16x and isotropic filtering, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw similar GPU-level improvements on the next box running X games, but I also expect to see a massive generational leap in CPU performance when Ryzen CPU technology is installed in the next-gen consoles, something that X categorically does not deliver. So going back to the issues we had with X back Pat. Well, Just Cause 3 was still CPU bound, so running that at a locked 30 FPS completely off the table. But Ryzen could easily get that to its target frame rate. And hey, maybe even that unpatched Assassin's Creed Unity code could finally lock to 60 frames per second. Now that would be fun. But what I will say is this, based on my conversations with Microsoft, Pack and Pat isn't easy. They have an entire engineering team on the job with over 100 testers working to ensure that games designed for one console operate just fine on the next. There have been compatibility issues that they've had to deal with on the X, and that's with a system that's built with many architectural similarities to base hardware. The next gen Xbox, well, I'd imagine we'd have a significant revamp to the GPU, not to mention that entirely different CPU setup. Now, what I've learned is, despite the x86 baseline consoles just don't work like PCs here. And yeah, that's pretty much what Mark Cerny said to me just before the PlayStation 4 Pro launch, when I asked why existing games couldn't tap into the power of the system. As he said at the time, compatibility just can't be taken for granted. Thankfully, boost mode came along in the fullness of time there, and it'll be fascinating to see what kind of compatibility story there is for PlayStation 5. Now, with the strides that Microsoft is making here, 
I just can't see Sony wanting to leave behind that enormous installed base of PlayStation 4 users. Interesting stuff then, but that's where I'm going to leave things for now. I'll be publishing the full interview with Microsoft on Digital Foundry at Eurogamer in the days to come, and I'll update the video description below with the full thing once that's posted. But in the meantime, please do like and subscribe to support what we do here at Digital Foundry. And if you want us to get bigger, to do more, please consider supporting our Patreon, where we offer up every video we do in pristine source file format. And to ensure you don't miss a thing, follow us on Twitter for all the latest DF updates. But that's all for me for now. Thanks for watching.